Well, yeah, thanks for Claude for inviting uh, Neil and I to do these presentations. We think they're very important. Uh, I know there are a lot of acronyms in here, um, and uh, so NOx, nitrogen oxide, VOCs, things like benzene, ethylene, and so on. SIP, uh, State Implementation Plan, Clean Air Plan. Those are the ones you need to know for this presentation primarily. So this is a quote from the 2011 SIP. Uh, that was used at the time to justify no added pollution control measures on any major sources in the dallas Worth area. But get used to it because you're going to be hearing a lot more of this kind of thing for the next 10 months. Some of us, however, think there should be a plan B just in case we do need more control measures, just in case SIP plans don't work out the way they're supposed to. And with TSEC's track record so far, we think there's good reason for skepticism. They've never yet met a clean air deadline uh, for a plan despite trying time and time again. And in fact, the margin of error in terms of the design value has gotten larger, especially this last time when we were supposed to be in attainment by 2013, and we were not, and it was off by a full nine parts per billion. Is air quality getting better in DFW? Not really since 2007. There's all kinds of metrics to show that. One is the one here produced by TSEC, which really shows the design value, the three-year running average for the worst performing monitor in the area. As you can see, it's pretty much flat uh, ever since the 2007-2008 ozone season. Uh, these are the number of exceedance days. You often see this slide as well. And as you can see, there's a pattern here, but it's not really going down much. And here are the number of monitors that are exceeding uh, the, the standard, and that's not really improving either. There's another reason why you should aim for a better plan, and that's because that public health is threatened even at ozone levels below 75 part per billion. In other words, the plan that we're aiming at right now isn't sufficient to protect public health according to the American Lung Association and according to the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee which advises EPA about where these standards should be. They say it should be somewhere between 60 and 70 and that's where we're headed probably the next time we gather in this room some years from now. You should also reduce ozone pollution as much as you can because it leads to reductions of other kinds of dangerous pollution like particulate matter which is a particularly insidious form of pollution. Almost every month I see a new report linking it to Parkinson's disease, brain disorders, not just heart and respiratory um, matters anymore, but a variety of health concerns just because of this, this one pollutant. But t approach is close enough, they say, and at least four monitors above 75 parts per billion after accounting for that new fuel mix that you just heard about. After that low sulfur mix hits in 2017, they've modeled for the results, and their modeling shows that still there'll be four monitors above the standard. We don't know about Wise County, even though it's a non-attainment area, there is no monitor there. Many of us think that you would find even higher ozone levels in Wise County because of the very wind patterns that were discussed earlier. It's very similar to what happened in 2007, when there were also four monitors above the 85 standard at that point. And in that case, the EPA regional administrator said, no, that's not good enough. You have to go back and do it over. And in fact, EPA has already made that decision in terms of enforceability with this SIP. Uh, the quote above here, this one, is actually from the EPA citing the reduction in ozone values in the Dallas Worth area, really across the country, as a result of this low sulfur mix. Now, they tell you specifically that Tarrant County is still going to be above the ozone standard. The bottom quote is the way that this information was presented in November to us here at the committee. Close enough relies on weighted evidence. This is a category in every state plan. It's supposed to be hard science. It's supposed to be things that you can enforce, that have numbers with them, that are quantifiable. Instead, you often get things that are not quantifiable. You get things like air quality marketing and outreach. Now, I defy anybody to put a tons per day value on air quality marketing and outreach that you can actually enforce and quantify. You can't. It's a catch-all category where they hope to throw in measures that do something, but in fact, it's just a hope and a wish. And as you can see from the other slides, it, they hardly ever work. Talk about ozone trends and the reduction in NOx. The quote above is from an earlier set where the state was promoting the fact that they had cut NOx so much that you would see certainly trends in the future which would pay off in lower ozone values. But it didn't happen because the rate then was also flat the same way it is now. It's not how much NOx you cut, 
It's where, what sources, and what monitors they affect. So close enough and weight of evidence didn't work in 2000, or 2007, or 2011. And what are the odds of it happening this time, when there's a daunting task ahead of us where we have to drop 13 parts per billion over four summers, something that's never happened before in the history of state airplanes. So a plan that was truly protecting public health would model for attainment at 70 instead of 75, just to be sure you get to 75 in the first place. You quit relying on vague weight of evidence submissions and you implement real control measures. This is what we're talking about. This is part of the Clean Air Act and the Rackham uh, language, reasonably available control measures. You're supposed to implement these measures as expeditiously as practicable. You're supposed to consider all available control measures, including ones from existing sources. And if you're rejecting them, as the state has done over and over again, you're supposed to give economic or technical reasons why they're not being implemented. So a smart Rackham approach to this plan would be to have control measures that have the largest reductions on the most stubborn monitors, those four monitors that are still above 75, that are available with current technology and have the largest co-benefits in terms of particulate matter reduction or other kinds of pollution reduction. So what are the most stubborn monitors in the area? Well, for 14 out of the last 15 years, it's been monitors in Denton and Tarrant County. And as you saw just a minute ago, that's still true today. So the first strategy we're going to talk about is SCR on the cement kilns. SCR is selective catalytic reduction. The three cement kilns are still the single largest sources of air pollution in North Texas. They release a lot of NOx. They release a lot of other things as well that are bad for public health. They're located just to the south of the Tarrant-Dallas County line. That's what makes them such potent polluters in terms of our problems. We're the only non-attainment area in the country that's dealing with so much uh, cement plant pollution directly upwind. Um, again, this repeats the information from the state about wind direction. It comes in from the southeast east, goes out in northwest west. If you overlay these patterns on top of where the cement plants are, guess what? It's exactly where the four most stubborn monitors are for this plan. In 1999-2000, when we first brought this issue up, the state said, well, we think we're going to get more benefits actually from controlling construction time uh, or things like uh, speed limits. There was already then four pilot tests going on for SCR cement plants in Europe. As it turns out, though, when they actually did the modeling, they found out, whoa, when you, get, when you cut pollution from these plants by 50%, you get a huge drop in ozone, uh, up to 12 parts per billion in some places and 1 to 4 parts per billion in the four core counties, Collin, Denton, Tarrant, and Dallas. As a result, the North Texas Steering Committee recommended a 50% cut. Yeah, let's get those reductions. Instead, the state offered a 20% or less cut. The state had another chance to incorporate SCR when that SIP didn't work out. They had a mid-course correction. Um, and according to the TNRCC, then the predecessor of these guys, the application of that technology at cement kilns was found to be problematic. Now, this was a point where a full-scale SCR unit was up and running in Europe. They were having catalyst problems at first, but then they corrected them, certainly by the time this quote was given uh, to us at the time. But the state didn't interview anybody with that German uh, cement kiln, and so they used this as an excuse not to adopt the technology. In 2005, there was a kiln study that the TSEC was forced to do because of a settlement with us. They picked five cement kiln experts, they let them loose, and this is what they came back with. SCR is an available control technology for dry kilns. It's commercially available now. It can get up to 85% reductions in nitrogen oxide. And the cost is under $2,000 per ton at a time when we were spending $13,000 per ton on a program called TURP, which is about engines. In 2006, the American cement manufacturer, CMEX, said, well, yeah, SCR is a proven effective control technology for cement plants. So the industry itself is now admitting this. And they also said it was available control technology and submissions that they made for a new plant in Florida. In 2006, it was reported that because of modeling, uh, you could actually see these cuts reduce ozone levels to such an extent that you could almost bring all of Fort Worth and Arlington into compliance with the federal standard by 2009. And this is the chart proving that. And if you look here, there are one to three 
plus parts pavilion reduced in these sites here, Arlington, Northwest Fort Worth, including Keller, a problematic site now. And it had a huge effect on the model overall. And this is the kind of result that they model for. The more purple and blue it is, the, the more reductions you get. And as you can see, the influence of the kilns are widespread. And this is one that puts together all three kilns, what's the worst possible damage they can do. And you can see where they have up to 12 parts per billion <coughs> increases in Wise County. But the state's response was interesting. They said, well, gee, it did happen, but you didn't have any effect here on the Frisco monitor, which that year was the monitor that was driving the model. And the model determines everything. It determines your policy and what you're aiming for. And because it didn't impact the Frisco monitor, they said, well, we're not really going to look at it then. They ignored the effect in Tarrant, Denton counties, and decided to look only at Frisco. And it's true. You know, the kills raised ozone levels 1 to 12 parts per million over this wide area, but, but not in Frisco. Now, a more cynical person might suggest that they picked a model specifically to exclude impacts from cement kilns and coal plants and so on, because at the time they picked this model, this was the history of problematic monitors in the area. And remember, 14 out of the last 15 years it's been Denton or Tarrant County. hasn't changed any since then. In 2007, despite all that, this, this commission, or the uh, committee here, the local committee, requested that there be pilot testing for SCR. That request was rejected by the state. And it was rejected in a funny way because, you know, they said, well, we really don't know what the effect of this has been, and there's been no testing of this kind of technology on the local council. so we don't know that they're going to work the same way that they have in Europe. <laughs> Which was the whole point, of course, of asking for pilot testing to occur in Ellis County. And by this time, you now have three fully operating SCR units going on in Europe. Lots and lots of history. <laughs> In 2008, the Bush administration regional administrator asked the kilns themselves to do pilot testing. That request was also rejected. In 2010, TXI de decommissions its wet kilns. Those are four less wet kilns going on in middle of the At this point, they quit burning hazardous waste fuel. In 2011, we were told that we didn't need any more control measures because people were going to go out and buy new cars in such numbers, and these new cars were going to be so clean during a recession, we're going to go out and buy these cars, that that would make all the difference in the world. And so there was no necessity for any new control measures. And just like now, the photochemical modeling was rigorously evaluated, and there was a big weight of evidence category involved. In fact, it's the only SIP so far that resulted in higher DD values after it was implemented than before. Still no SCR as of that SIP <coughs> because it hasn't demonstrated any kind of new information. And at that point, there were now one, two, three, four, five SCR units operating in Europe. And still they said, well, we don't see any difference, despite the huge amount of track record now that SCR had at cement counts and in high dust and low dust any kind of situation you can imagine, the information was there. In 2012, Astro settled with the Justice Department decided to close down its wet kilns. At the end of this year, there will only be dry kilns with something called SNCR operating in North Texas. And remember what that report said in 2005, SCR is an available technology for dry kilns. So no more excuses about wet kilns and so on. There are only going to be dry kilns as of next year, and that's an available technology for them. When, because they already have SNCR on these units, it's really, really low cost to now add a small SCR unit on top of that to kind of stack them. And in fact, you get removal rates that are often better than SCR or SNCR alone. You get improved efficiency, you get smaller operating cost, and it's much, much easier to retrofit this technology. You also get co-benefits like significant reductions in particulate matter, dioxin pollution, and VOCs. You also might get lower asthma rates in Tarrant County and Wise County and so forth. This is the Cook Children's Hospital study that showed that asthma rates here in this corner of the area were much higher than in this corner of the area. 
We wonder why that was so. And by the way, I got invited to a meeting by these folks, and I wasn't quite sure why I was there until this slide came up and then everybody at the table turned and looked at me. They knew already. They knew what the source was. And in fact, 2012, some, nurse, uh, uh, some nurses at UTA confirmed that this was indeed the pattern, that it ties directly into the plume patterns from the middle of the cement counts. So 2018, gosh, I don't know. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight now SCR plants going two in the United States alone, one more that's due for Italy by the end of next year. This is those previous modeling exercises I showed you from 2007. This is what they're using this time for this SIP. I just wanted to show you side by side to show that really the problem hasn't changed much and these guys are still influencing ozone levels in the same way that the model looks at for this SIP. Furthermore, in 2013, UTA did a study that said if you reduce cement plant pollution by 90% between the hours of 6 a.m. and 12 noon, you get over a two-part privilege decrease in the Denton monitor alone. So, with that result in mind, you bring down that to almost 75 or below, and you have an impact on Keller that brings it down below 75. We don't know about these other sites because the monitoring doesn't go back that far, and we certainly don't know about Wise County because, as you heard, there are no ozone monitors in Wise County, despite it being a non-attainment county now. <coughs> so, SCR in kilns is random. It's technologically feasible, it's economically feasible, and as much as I like to criticize TSET, EPA has been a co-facilitator in this process. They have not held the state to the standard that they're supposed to. And this time, they must get the state to explain why this technology is not being implemented as expeditiously as practical, because you have, you have the effect here. You can get to 75 faster and easier and more cost-effectively with this control technology than almost any other thing you want to talk about. And the evidence is there. So let's talk about strategy number two, changing to electric compressors. Oil and gas pollution right now is very significant. In terms of NOx, it's larger than the kilns and electric generating units in the area by far. In fact, combined, it's larger than that. And often for VOCs, you find an on-road uh, comparison uh, that's smaller than the number of VOCs that are being put out by the industry right now. By the way, the state said that, gosh, we don't know how to estimate truck traffic of mobile sources tied to oil and gas, but we found two studies, one in 2005, another in 2013 from RAND, that actually did such a thing. So that, that methodology is out there if only the state would apply it. Here's how it's usually presented to us in these technical committee meetings. This is a TSET chart, and as you can see, there's two categories here.